Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. (laughs) This is Rick Marana, and I'm back on the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yes, he is. Rick Morata, the elder statesman of drums and uh, somebody who's playing I've looked up to for a long, long time. And then I met him. Oh, I appreciate that. And uh, holy cow, I only uh, think more of the world of him now that, uh, that we've gotten to know each other. We were with Mark Shulman this morning. And we were contemplating ordering food because we were at Cafe Laurent. And he said, man, this place is great. This is my favorite restaurant. In the you whole world. Get something. In the whole world. He says, it's my favorite restaurant in the whole world. You got to get something. And I said, yeah, but you know what? I just sent a text to Rick Morata and I offered to bring him deli. Yeah. So I don't, I'm not sure if we want to eat breakfast yet. And, oh, man, he just gushed. He said, oh, Rick Morata, what a beautiful guy. Please give him my love. So that's what Mark Shulman has to say, and that's what listeners, everybody has to say about Rick Morata. We were talking about drone footage because uh, this year at the NAMM show, Zoom, the company Zoom that makes audio recorders, and we use their recorders for uh, recording the Break It Down show, employed your video to launch their, their product. Tell us how that happened. Well, they called... They had spoken to John to Christopher about, you know, about handle, you know, about sending stuff out to us. Okay. They wanted to do a video. Would we do a little shot? I did one. My brother Jerry did one. They sent them to a bunch of people. And um, so I kind of get like to the, I always think to myself, well, I don't really want to do, what is everybody else going to do? And, you know, Jerry is on the East Coast and I was out here on the West Coast at the time. And uh, I didn't, I said, Jerry. you got to make your video better. I you. said, Jerry, <laughs> I said, Jerry, what are you going to do? I said, I, you know what? I don't even know what you want, you're going to do. But you realize you have to do a video. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was in the middle of doing some recording and I was doing some stuff out here. But I wasn't as busy as what he, what he was doing. And so I said to him, I said, well, let's just do it and we'll, we'll sort it all out later. Uh... So I, then I, I, I said, I said, listen, um, I, I went down to my assistant, Christina, who's married to Hugo Boards, is her husband, and he's a great videographer, a great photographer, and he's, he's just sort of the opposite of me. He's got an enormous amount of patience and wherewithal. He's, you know, he's really young, and he, he really is really talented at what he does, and he just never phones anything in. And I said to him, <laughs> wait a minute, how is that opposite of you? <laughs> he said, <laughs> he said to me, I went down and I said to him, S- uh, listen, Hugo, I know you're really busy, but David Villa is the guy at Zoom that contacted us, by the way. David has been unbelievably great. He's, David, um, I've known, I met David before. He's a drummer. Okay. And, he, and, he, and he, he works at Zoom. I think he's head of the marketing department. I think he's a drummer, yeah. And, uh, so he, um, uh, I, I went down to Hugo and I said, I want to do this. This, this there. I explained the whole thing to him. He was very familiar with Zoom stuff. Sure. Because he, he handles, you know, he does drones and video and he has recorders. And he said, uh, and I showed him what I was doing. It was an H1. It's this little uh, H1N recorder. It was the new model of this H1 that they had. Yeah. It's awesome. It's you really guys can good. look it up on the web, Zoom H1N. So... So um, I said, I just, I just, I know what everybody's going to do. It's uh, the last thing I want to do is sit down, play drums again, uh. and then somebody <laughs> shooting me playing drums again, again. Uh-huh. playing the same shit I was playing before again. <laughs> and so I see Christina, Hugo, almost. I don't even. I almost don't even have the words out of my mouth. He goes, oh, don't even. It's, I got it already. I know what we're going to do. Let's just set your drums. Let's get everything set up, and we'll do it. Yeah. So we went down to the studio. We didn't have everything really set up for recording at the moment because we're putting the studio back together for the ninth time after tearing it up, put, put it together. 
I mean, we put it back together. We'll get to that. <laughs> and then we, we, put, we, we got everything together. And he just started shooting. And Christina, my assistant, came in. And she's standing there. And there, she's directing. They were literally, it was like, it was really great. It was so much fun. She is real involved creatively. Yeah. He's real involved creatively. They almost didn't even talk to me about what I was going to do. Shoot here. And it, I could see the two of them talking. No, why don't you shoot him this angle here? Get a shot of that hi hat, and then we'll do this, we'll do that, and so they just, I just did whatever they said to do. You know, I just did it. I was kind of just tuning the drums and that kind of thing. Yeah, horsing around. And at the very end, I said, "Let's just do a shot." I think Hugo, Christina, or Hugo said to me, "Let's get a shot of you turning." I I turned and I just smiled. Uh huh. Yeah. And then it stopped. You know, and then we talked about it. That should be it. So we shot that a couple of times. The point I'm making, the whole idea of it was, I never play the drums. (laughs) (laughs) But it was shot so well, in my opinion. And and Hugo does all his own editing too. He does the editing for all the stuff that they shoot. Yeah. He just was up in Oakland. He was just there last week shooting. Oh wow. There was this giant uh, Hermes uh, event that was going on there, and they hired him to shoot it. He's editing that now. These huge events. He, he does a lot of these big events where he shoots the events. He, he shoots the construction of the material, putting the event together. Together, But they like that so much they hired him to shoot the events. Now they're starting to hire him to shoot the events themselves because the stuff's so good. Yeah. Anyway, so we sent this to, to Zoom. And uh, David Villa sent me an email and said, man, it's really nice. Yeah. Um. Do you mind if we use it to launch the H1N, the product, at the NAMM show? I said, absolutely not. And I said, but I, I, I really, uh, I want you to, and he, go, oh, he said, can you tell me who that guy is that shot the thing? Because can we get in touch with you? Mind if we get in touch with him? The next thing you know, Hugo was off to Patagonia carrying Zoom gear. They sent out, they sent out the H6 and I think a couple other things. And they've been in touch doing some events. And they just called him to do another event. He's been so busy, he wasn't able to do this one. But I think he's going to work with them in the future. Good for him. Yeah. And it's good stuff. I mean, they sent me an L12. Oh, my God. Huh. I mean, we're, my brother and I are doing this gig this summer, and we plan on recording it on the L12. Okay. So uh, David sent one out to um, to the vineyard to Massachusetts for us because we're going to be uh, doing that again all summer. You are, you're gonna, you're getting ready to leave to Martha's Vineyard to spend the summer there. Yeah, and you're gonna do that gig. Yes. on Thursday nights again. Wednesday nights or Wednesday nights. Excuse me. Um, let me back up though. Was your video better than Jerry's? <laughs> oh, <laughs> so Jerry did a great, great video. Uh huh. I'll try to pull it up. Okay. It was really great, and I and but we didn't. I gave him no idea. No, 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 nothing, nothing, nothing. And he was working on this record. He was producing a record and playing on it. Mm. And he did did this great job. And I said, Jerry, send me your video. And he sends it to me. And he was so busy. It was like the way he said, oh, yeah, 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 okay. Oh, yeah, I'll get it off to you right away. And he sends it over. And I look at it and I thought, oh, man. It's just him sitting behind the console. Uh And then... He had his whole crew there, you know. He had he was in his in the studio. He was in Dreamland, uh, in Woodstock, mm-hmm. doing a great record. Engineers are there. Everybody's there. Yeah, I've got me and Hugo and <laughs> Is Christina. He you, Hugo and Christina. And so he's got <laughs> in the garage. And you could see uh, one of the engineers. I I'm, I don't know. I can't remember which one it was. Was carrying the H the the H one N around. You know, he's recording it. And Jerry walks and he walks Jerry out and the artist out to the to the studio she gets behind the piano Mm -hmm. plays and then he gets behind the drums and plays and it sounded so great i said jerry how did you do the thing where you got the audio to come in from the recording i thought he sent the audio direct to the h1 oh i thought he went direct in yeah he didn't he used the it was all peripheral mics on no man those are the mics yeah I sound like a fucking ad for this thing, don't I? <laughs> well, you get to. They sent it to you for free. But the, no, they, they, they didn't say to me I had to do any of that stuff. I just was shocked when he said to me, no, that was him. That's wide open air. Wide open, walking around. And the sound, it just sounded like like gated Tom sound and everything. Yeah. And the way he was hitting it, 
it just sounded really amazing. Huh. So then I sent him. And was it the same for yours? And when, when you recorded, were you just using the H1N? Yeah, just the H1N. Oh, yeah, because it sounds great, too. Because otherwise we have to, we would be false. Yeah. Yeah. When we first went out there, I, I, I was. I've never Hugo had an H1N, shooting. though. Can you even go direct into that, or is it just for uh, recording uh, you with those I microphones? I think you can. Yeah. There's an input? Oh, okay. Yeah. So I've got a little line in here. All right. Well, but it's mostly like for what you do right now. Yeah. Probably this is instead of carrying that gigantic blunderbuss around. You know, <laughs> gigantic <laughs> blunderbuss. To be it's honest, about twice the size of this. <laughs> yeah. And this is not even half the size of a cigarette I'm pack. Pretty sure you could keister that. That makes my. Microphone. Microphone. That yeah. makes my phone a blunderbuss. By the way. <laughs> I'd hate to keister it. Though. <laughs> oh boy. Not, but it could be done. Uh, yeah, my only point. Wouldn't want to do it. So I sent Jerry. Mine after that, and he just responded, That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, not fair. He had a team of fair. a dozen guys. Uh, Jerry, I haven't seen your video. He said it's cheating. I'm just that's looking cheating. at it. <laughs> that's awesome. It's cheating, but still awesome. <laughs> you know what it is? Okay. The fact is that the listeners of our show, many of whom are musicians who all know who you are everybody already knows you can play the drums there's a million clips of you playing the drums and and they're all terrific you should go watch them all but the really neat thing about this video was like it was almost like watching when you if you got to peek into the shaolin temple and you had the master there and he was just like you know moving bowls around oh, he's so not silly. showing you any kung fu um, he's just moving bowls around when you talk about you. the master then you're talking about <laughs> different guys you're talking about guys like steve gadd and vinnie caliuto and and keith carlock and those kind of guys i'm i'm just out there you know dropping sticks as jim gordon used to say you know <laughs> i just dropped the sticks when we're sitting across from Steve Gadd, we're going to ask him the same question. He's going to be like, you know, I'm just dropping the sticks. It's Rick Marotta and his brother, and those guys are the ones that are doing it. <laughs> Steve, no. Yeah, I, I don't know if we get that out true. of Steve. Exactly, no, you but. won't get that out of Steve. <laughs> <laughs> but you could tell him that I said no. He's not going to say that. To him. <laughs> we, won't, we won't allow it if he tries to go that way. He's, yeah. I, I talked to him the other day. He... Uh, I met him at a NAMM show many years ago, and I've, so I've never spent any time with him or even just a few minutes of conversation. Just, it was, you know, I shook his hand and said, hey, thanks, Steve, and he said, you know, well wishes, but uh, he seems like he's such a serious guy. No, he's one of the funniest guys I've ever met. Oh, that's, that's so good to hear. I because. can't even tell you how many times I've picked up the phone. Uh-huh. Maybe it would be 3 o'clock in the morning my time, or 6 o'clock in the morning. And I pick up the phone, and I know who it is. Uh-huh. It's him. And he's <laughs> not in the United States, because okay. it's either in the middle of the... You know, it's, yeah. it's like afternoon, wherever he is. Right. He's but he doesn't from... even care, because he has a joke. <laughs> <laughs> and I pick up the phone, and the first thing I hear, I go, hello? And I'll hear, so this guy is walking down the street... <laughs> And then my response always is, where are you? Do you know what time it is? <laughs> and he's like, let me finish the joke. And all he does is laugh. He'll tell the joke. He'll laugh for 10 minutes at his own joke. And then that's the end of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh, okay. He's a very, very the, funny guy. The last time I was here, I stated that in my book of drum stuff, I put... Uh, I put the uh, hour that the morning comes up there with 50 ways. Uh, so there's the comparison. Uh, our listeners can uh, tweet us and debate it if you'd well, like. Well, the difference is that 50 ways was a s- slam hit. And James's hour that the morning comes didn't do a thing. Yeah. You know, that, that Dad Loves His Work album didn't really sell a whole lot. Have you guys been doing well with the show? Have you been sort of, has it been... Moving along? Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah, for it's sure. growing steadily. It, it, what we don't have is a, a smash hit home run because it seems like we're picking up our listeners in, you know, little bunches at a time. Is it just drummers or is it? No, we do all kinds all of kinds. stuff. Yeah. So in our daily lives, I was a private investigator and, and Pete was a spy in Afghanistan and Iraq. And 
so sometimes we have military strategists on. We have people who do things. Oh, that sounds interesting. Having to do with justice. Yeah. We have. Uh, what about Skunk Baxter? Have you ever oh. talked to him? <laughs> no. Oh, you know, we were gonna we were gonna talk to him at Nam last year. It just didn't work out. Cra- you know, it's so crowded. It's, like you don't want to stand around and like no, wait, no, like no. the moment passes. So the moment passed, but you know. But he's a great guy. He for be, sure. He uh, he'd be more than willing to talk to you. Yeah about whatever he can talk to you about. But he's got sort of clearance and stuff like that. He has some great stories, though. Yeah. You know, I've known him a long time. And one time I was, he told me a story, a a very interesting story about, you know, guys that walk around looking like us that don't expect you to be anything but a bum. Yeah. And he's not a bum. Right. I don't think I'm a bum either. (laughs) <laughs> nice so. digs for a bum. Yeah. I do know some <laughs> bums, though, that look like me. <laughs> I'm Did watching TV one show. day. Pick out the bum. Pick the, yeah, who's the bum? <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm watching some sort of a, uh, uh, like 60 Minutes or a, that kind of news magazine show. Yeah. All about, Jeff, all about the... Just a little bit of him playing guitar, uh-huh. and the rest of it was him walking into sort of like the Pentagon with a briefcase in a suit, <laughs> looking exactly the same way, sitting down having a meeting with an Air Force general, and then they interview the general, and he's talking about how his strategy and s- stuff like that is really important to the to the to the uh, armed services, to the government. Yeah. What the shit? You know, you sit with him. He's just great. You know, he's a good guy and he's a normal musician. He got way into this whole strategy thing and 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 missile defense launch and all that kind of crap. Yeah. And it's interesting. I think he'd be a, a great guy for you guys, especially for you guys to talk to. Would be him. Yeah, that'd be terrific. I wonder yeah. where he is. Love to talk to him. I run into him. I ran into him on Martha's. As a matter of fact, last the year before last, before Jerry and I did the gig at Lola. Sat around. He was at the same place that we that Jerry and I play. Uh-huh. He was there, and coincidentally, and uh, someone else ran into him at the airport. Said, "I just saw Scott Baxter at the airport." Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was just here last night or something. But uh, I don't know where he is right now. I'll, I'll check into it. If I find him, I'll let him know that you guys are looking to talk to him, and he'd be. I think he'd be interested in doing it because he could. Yeah, he could shift gears back both, and forth all yeah. day long. Sure. We wow. did that kind of with Stuart, too, because uh, Stuart Copeland, because, you know, he and I both have time in the Middle East and know enough Arabic to, like, say hello when I'd like some coffee kind of thing. Yeah, he grew up in, like, Beirut or something. Yeah, exactly. So there's always those little parallels. That Does he speak the language? You know, I, I, we didn't get too far into it because I barely speak it. I understand a lot more. They cussed at each other. Yeah. They're just... like, yeah, I know this, and I know this, and I know this. And it yeah. was like two guys who were like, yeah, you've been to, uh-huh. you know, whatever. Yeah. You get a, a Mexican next door neighbor for a little while, and you become friends. And the first, you know, the first words they teach you in Spanish are. If you just say like, you, praise teach God, you the after... genitals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you say praise God after everything you say in Arabic, which is pretty easy to say, you know, it sounds like you're speaking a lot more Arabic than you actually are. You know? uh-huh. it's just like, yeah, go down the street and turn left. Praise God. You know? <laughs> it's like, oh, that guy really knows his stuff. So that's how. That's my level of Arabic. Right so these there. guys went back and forth about three or four, you know, turns. They just and it sounded like a conversation, and all they were saying was, "Hello, how you doing? Mm-hmm. How are you doing? Hey, what's up, man? <laughs> <laughs> what it is?" And it just kept going like that. And, and then I was you like, say so afterwards, "So what did you just say? Not really anything." Not, yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah, it was the. Did he talk about his brother Ian? Did we talk about Ian at all? No, not much. Yeah. Not much. Talked about I gotta, Miles for a second, but I, I, I got to tell you, I knew Ian pretty well. Yeah. What a great guy. Huh. huh. What a nice guy. And boy, he had a story. Wow. Not Middle East story that I knew about, but he, I think he was in the Vietnam, in Vietnam. Do you know anything about him? No, no. not really at all. You should, you should find out a little bit more about what he did there. Really? Okay. He was one of those guys, from what I remember, and he told me about it, but he was such an affable guy and, you know, a happy guy. And he used to go out with Courtney. Cox, he was head of frontier management, I think it was. Hmm. Hmm. They had they had IRS records, not frontier management, IRS, um, and what was the man? What was Miles Management Company? It was the police, IRS, FBI, FBI, and whatever the 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 agency was. Yeah. He was 
the agency guy. Miles was the management guy. He was agency guy. And Courtney used to work huh. there, and they used to go out. They were they're actually second or third cousins or something, but they used to go out. And he told me a little bit about, about it. He was one of those guys that they that they dropped way behind enemy lines alone. Yeah. And you have an assignment. Yeah. Which and, you know and get home. Is. Good luck. And you're on your you you're on your own. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We had Jack Barsky on. He's that. But he is a KGB spy, German-born KGB spy, who they dropped here in America. In, like, Ohio. Yeah, and they're like, be an American. And he's like, um, okay. You've lived here 20 years. See if you can meet, you know, the president or something. And then he just tries to figure out what he can do. And so when we talk, see, the thing is, is like, he'll go on a show, like, Good Morning America, because he's pitching his book or whatever. And they'll do, like, the seven minutes with him. But I can talk to him, like, tradecraft to tradecraft. So, like, we call it spy versus spy shows, you know, because... When he says something, I'll, you know, and we come from different angles in how we approach the work, and so it's these fascinating conversations that only two old spies can have, you know, and it's just, it's neat. So whenever we can, we try to get people like that on. It's because a guy like that, that has the ability to walk out of that situation, you know, because as soon as... Well, always, what, did he get caught or something? Oh, Jack? No. He turned he, coat. He's an American citizen now. Yeah. Have I seen him on 60 Minutes? Yes. I think yes. I have. That's the yes. guy you saw on for 60 sure. Minutes, yeah. yeah, he advises for that show, The Americans and everything. And what, how he got out was, he's you know, like, because it just kind of, he's like, I'm just making so much money. I'm so successful already in America. I have a new family. Like, it's just that the time has come for me to stop doing this, but you don't get to quit. He got recalled. And he's like, oh, by the way. I've got HIV. And they're like, you know what? Why don't you stay out there? You just stay in. And so basically he was dead to them already. So they didn't have to kill him. And that's how he was able to step out. Wow. Crazy, Would right? Would they have killed him? You know, you're going back to Russia on a recall mission from being a spy. You can't assume that you're going to be alive. You know, would they have? Who knows? When he got back, they right. might have? Yeah, they would have terminated. Because look, there's a, there's a phrase in our business called terminating with prejudice. And so you're like, you are no longer valuable. We're going to terminate you. It's just how termi- term- terminated are you, you know? So like in the States, they wouldn't do that. They'd be like, yeah, great. Go find a job somewhere and see you later. But it doesn't seem fair. <laughs> the Russians weren't fair like for that stuff. So my, my uncle was a, an embassy guard in Moscow <coughs> in the height of the Cold War in the mid-'80s. And... I never got the details about what happened, but as far as I know, he was, and th- he, his job as an embassy guard, they took him and they sent him to the Language Institute in Monterey, and they taught him Russian like a Russian fucking sailor. And so he can, he's like a ghetto cussing Russian. He's not, uh, you know, donde está la biblioteca kind of Russian. <laughs> so <laughs> they, the uh, they teach him that, and then... They set him loose, but he's working in the embassy, and I never got the details about what happened, but there was an incident, and there was, you know, there were Russians who had, had been killed by Russians, and he was, I don't know, witness to it or whatever, so they had to yank him out of there, and they said, uh, what do you want to do? And he said, well, I don't know, maybe I'll go. And they said, why don't you take a lighter detail to finish out your career? And he said, okay. And they said, go chill out for a little while. So they sent him to, I think he went to Australia for a couple months to do nothing. And then they said, when you're ready to go back to work, you know, call us. And he called and they said, okay, we're going to send you to Japan next. So they sent him back to Monterey to learn Japanese and then sent him to Japan and he finished his career there. But whatever it was happened involved some situation where there were Russians Mm -hmm who decided to make a break for it, and their break for it was head to the embassy, and then there was an incident at the embassy that he was party to. And, and the, they didn't make it to the embassy. The Russians did not make it to the embassy, and they said, let's get everybody who was involved in that hell out of there. And it's relax. like the mob, especially in Russia. So when you try to get out, or you get called in because you're not in the family the way you're acting, then it's more like that. It's not about being fair necessarily for those guys. Yeah. Yeah. It's just... You know, it's mob. It's it's mob. Okay. Let's you talk know, about music with Rick Moran. Well, I, I had one, <laughs> but I have I have one other thing to tell you. I had a, f- a friend years ago. Do you remember the movie The Hunt for Red October? Sure, yeah. I love that movie. Uh-huh. There was a guy in that movie who was played one of the Russian 
sailors. Yeah. Blonde guy, and his name is Anatoly Davidov. Okay. He was, uh, I knew uh, Tony Levin's ex was, um, had dated him. He was a Russian guy, and I met him through through Willie, uh, Willamina Frankfurt. And then um, we became friends, and and uh, long story short, we went to dinner one night in a Japanese restaurant, Anatoly and I. And we sat down, and he ordered <clears throat> in Japanese. <laughs> Fluent Japanese. Uh-huh. I mean, he had... I used to go to Japan so much that I could go into a restaurant, order an entire meal in Japanese, right. leave, and not speak a word of English. Uh-huh. But I knew everything in Japanese that I knew was was yes. just in a restaurant. Yes. Or he someone, walked in and made c- no no no. And he was having talk, conversations. Right? Yeah. He was the guy behind the counter was like in in Japanese big time. Yeah. So he was being charismatic. So I said. <laughs> Anatoly. So he was making a transition career-wise. And uh, I had introduced him to Carly Simon as well. And they hung up for a little bit. I said, Anatoly, what's all this about? And he said, I knew he was in the KGB at one time. Hmm. Here's the story. He was in the KGB in Tokyo. He walked into the American consulate and defected. In Tokyo. Uh, uh, to John's uncle. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah. Oh, my God. You should check. Yeah. I, that's really would be interesting. I'd love to hear from you if uh, you find out. We're going to find out. They sent him here. So I think it was in Japan. He, he defected in Japan to get to the United States. And I, I think see. he said he went to the embassy. He goes to the, comes here. He was, in, he was a KGB officer. And he was stationed in Japan. And he spoke fluent Japanese, yep. and of course, fluent uh, Russian, of course, and yeah. he f- spoke English. When he got to the States, he sort of worked himself into being a consultant on those movies. Sure. And Perfect. then they started putting him in the movies. And in Carlito's Way, was it Carlito's Way? I think it was Carlito's Way. He was a consultant in there because it had something to do with the Russian mob. Yeah. So and he was also in the movie uh, as a Russian mobster, <laughs> and I would see him every once in a while. But I happened to see the movie recently, and I and I remembered it, and I thought about him because I, I thought that that's movie. kind of a, a fascinating story. I, that's completely. I defected from one band to another. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but it was just spoke, as lethal. But as you spoke stuff. the language fluently. That's yeah, what allowed yeah, you yeah, to, yeah. to jump over there. The language of stupidity. Well, what... Uh, <laughs> okay, so when I very first met Rick, was at a NAMM show in around 88 or 89. And oh you looked like... You looked uh, in, that, in that big picture over there. Hair was all dark. You were slick. The way I described you to Pete was, you know, when you're talking to a girl and you're having a great time with the girl, and then somebody walks in who's just taller and more masculine than you are, and he's probably a... This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner. Or at John LG 69 At the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. And then somebody walks in who's just taller and more masculine than you are. And he's probably a, you know, he's probably like, guy? he's got a shiny beard. And he's just got, and that was, and that was Rick Murata. Well, a few years have gone by. Yeah, that's all And you've all changed gone. hairstyles <laughs> once or twice. And you've changed beard styles once or twice. And uh, now I look like a bum for sure. And, and now we're going to put you know, on I was, the game show. I was just about to shave bum. everything off, right? And go back to my normal look. The way this happened was I had to go down to Miami for a few months. Uh And I went, I I literally said, I do the weirdest things. have the weirdest conversations with myself. I can remember in a really, really terrible flight that I had on a Stevie Nicks tour. I remember getting off the plane, our plane. We were supposed to be landing in Boston. We couldn't. We ended up having to go back to New York. 
Landed in New York after doing leaving Boston to go to the Midwest that night, do a gig. We got there like three hours late. There was storms everywhere. It was horrible. We got struck by lightning, and we landed in New York. And I remember walking off the plane. It was the very end of the tour, and I turned, and I, my brain, I remember the words, didn't I couldn't even formulate them any right in my mouth because I was so, in my head, because I was so frazzled. Frazzled. I turned, and I looked at the, that, and I went, I don't do that anymore. And I turned around, walked, went into, got, and we were in New York, so I went off to my apartment. And uh, <clears throat> I went home, and I, and I went, yeah, I'm not going to do that anymore. It was just, it was a year of just constant, you know, being on the road is really, really hard. So anyway, this happened with the same kind of conversation I had with myself. I literally was on my way to to Miami. And when I go to Miami, I have one close friend down there and another buddy of mine who's a really close friend of mine who comes back, flies back and forth from New York. He's actually the reason I went down there. And my and my buddy, my really good friend down there who comes up to the vineyard to play golf and stuff. We, we're good golf buddies. He's a doctor. And I remember I was on my way down there and I went, well, if I'm going to feel like a castaway, I'm going to look like a castaway. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I just said. That's it. Yeah. And I was going to the club to play golf every day, and they're looking at me going, so when are you going to... It's getting worse. <laughs> <laughs> when are you going to shave? When are you going to get a haircut? My friend down there was, off, was, was walking around trying to make a collection to get up enough money to convince me to shave. He wanted to collect enough, mo- enough money for me to shave and get a haircut. I guess they don't like... Me walking around the country club looking like this. <laughs> I guess so, yeah. I said, oh, I've had enough of this, and I was about to shave it off, and Jerry called me, and he said, hey, listen, man, you can't shave it off. We're going to leave it like that. We're going to look really good in the band. He wanted the band, so he's going to look just about as bad as I look. And then <laughs> just about as bad. And with this look, with me, it's like, at this point in my life, people either love it or really don't love it, which means hate it. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's buckle. the oddest thing. <laughs> some of the some of the oddest people, like um, my friend's wife, Phil Rosenthal, who who did uh, Phil, who's that guy in that God picture right there? God damn it, I love Phil Rosenthal. Oh, he's great. Man. <laughs> it's like he just opens up his mouth and funny spills out of all it. the time. Yeah, Phil. So Phil started growing a beard. I was at his. He had a screening last week uh, that I went to at his house, and he started to grow a beard, and. There, Phil and Monica is his wife. They're the two of the straightest people that I know. They're incredibly nice. They're very down to earth, very straight, normal. And Monica, Monica, uh, Phil's wife is the. She was on Everybody Loves Raymond. She played Brad Garrett's wife. Okay. On the show. I never knew that. Yeah, that's Phil's. That's Phil's wife. Wow. In real life. She's a phenomenal actress. She's a really artistic person. And Phil was a creator of Everyone Loves. Yeah, Raymond. Yeah, he and and Ray. So, uh, anyway, Monica <laughs> sees me with the beard, and every time she sees me, she goes, oh, my God, the hair and the beard, just, you've got to leave it. It looks so great. And I'm thinking to myself, Monica, of all people, I said, I thought you were the one that was going to ban me from the house. I wasn't going to be allowed to come over the house. No, anymore. man, this is the master on the mountaintop shit I'm talking <laughs> no, about. No, no. Uh, that's exactly what no, it is. No, you got the wrong guy. And if you do decide to like clean it up at all or not, you just take it back to the Vilnius Nestavnik, the uh, the commander of the Red October. You got Sean Connery because you can <laughs> pull Connery, that off. That's well, that's it. That's the, probably what it would look like. Yeah, but uh, but that was a great look for him. That was, was a great look for yeah. him. Yeah, yeah. If I only looked like him, he was Mr. Universe or something at one point in his life. I think Sean Connery was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, he was like a bodybuilder. Wow, guy. I never yeah. knew that. Uh, I want to ask you a, a one or two music questions because we are... Uh, hate that. Yeah, we're, we're here. Uh, because I, I asked you last time about a couple of records that I was curious about. And then when we left, uh, I remember thinking, holy shit, I forgot to ask him about this. And it's Les Paul's 75th birthday party. Oh, yeah. Because I bring that up to people sometimes, and it seems like, how did people not see this? This was yeah. like the greatest collection of guitar players it was in good. one room that ever happened and i bring it up to people all the time and they're like i i miss that i didn't see it how in the hell did people not see yeah this nobody thing? i don't very few people saw it but 
anybody who did see it, I still hear about it now. Yeah. Um, that was pretty great. That was a great experience. I was the musical director on that. Yeah. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> and that was not an easy job. I bet. Oh. That's like hurting cats. Yeah. Yes. Dozens and well, dozens, dangerous dozens cats. of cats. Not like little eight pounders, but like yeah, big right. cats. So I was in New York and they had asked me to do this special for Cinemax. I think it was Cinemax at the time, right? Yeah. Okay. And um I'm trying to remember the name of the of the pr- producer. I had done something for them associated with them before and so they asked me to be the musical director. And he, his assistant, his producer, was, was really good, and she was really helpful. But they had, well, let's try to think about who it was. It was B.B. King. Uh-huh. Well, there was Les, Les Paul. Sure. B.B. King. Steve um, Miller. Miller from your neck of the woods. That surprised me. I, I was n- not as familiar with, of course, I love Steve Miller, but I always thought of him as the singer in, in his band, and I loved it. But when he went up there, I remember all the guitar players trading and, you know, everybody being up there for a couple of songs. And then Steve Miller got up there and he was up there for a long time. Uh huh. And I remember I him remember hanging with everybody. Oh, yeah. And I just remember thinking, I didn't realize he was that kind of a guitar player. He's a monster. No, he's a good guitar player. And then somebody told me, you know, he's, he's, Les Paul was his godfather. Oh, really? Yeah. So he's Les Paul has known Steve Miller all his life. Hmm. Uh, anyway, Steve Miller. So Steve Miller. Uh, uh, Shoot, J- Jimmy Dave, Page was there. Dave Dave Gilmore, Dave, not Jimmy Page. David Gilmore from okay, from Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd. Yeah. Slash had to be there. No. Uh, no. Nope. Eddie Van Halen. Eddie okay. Van Halen. Oh, I got Carly Simon to do it as a singer. Nice. I got Carly and I got Waylon Jennings and Jesse Coulter to both do it. I don't know if they kept Jesse, which was always really a big, that was a big problem for me because she's so great and there were such great people. And I had worked with Waylon in Nashville a couple of times and I just loved that family. I loved him and he just said, Rick, I'd be happy to do it. He came up from Nashville and did it. Who else played guitar? We had Jan Hammer playing keyboard on a couple of songs, Tony Levin. Mm-hmm. I had Dave Spinoza and Hugh McCracken both playing guitars <laughs> in the band. Me, uh, Tony, um, did I have, was Kenny Asher the keyboard player? I can't remember if it was Kenny or Leon Pendarvis. I can't, geez, I'm, really feel bad right now that I don't remember who played piano. It's been a while, by the way. Yeah, yeah it it's really. Been, it's You've been also been mentioned 87. a bunch of people that have passed. I mean, that's Was like that 87? 86 or so, 87 or 8. 87. Yeah. 87 or 80, 88. Had to be. Huh. It was, I'll tell you when it was. It was when I did that. Okay. The cover. The cover of the Modern one when Drama. you have a mullet? Yeah. Yeah. That nice. clearly is in the mid-80s. That was 87, I think. Yeah. Was that when you were playing drums for Color Me Bad? Yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> that was actually Stevie. That's the kit from Stevie Stewart, okay. which I have downstairs. Huh. I'll tell you, it was so, it was hurting cats is exactly what it was like, but it was the oddest cat hurting. Hmm. Dave Gilmore was loose as could be. Uh huh. Stephen was was pretty. You know, everybody was really cooperative. Eddie Van Halen called me. Every night from L.A. at 3 in the morning. I was married at the time. We were in New York. We were, my, you know, I was home uh-huh. in my apartment. Phone would ring. So it was midnight here and 3 at your place. And my ex-wife would look at me and go, Ben Halen again? I'd pick up the phone, and Eddie'd be like, Hey, Rick, the, listen, um, I, 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 just, I just got something I got to tell you. I, I'm really concerned. I'm a little worried. Don't, please... Uh, don't take it personally, but I, I'm afraid this thing I'm going to do is so Van Halen-ish. Uh, it's really fast. Maybe my brother could come. Maybe I could have the guys in the band come. I said, Eddie, I got really good guys here. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. Just come. <laughs> I'd have to talk him off the edge every two days. This went on for like a week. One night he calls. I wake up the next morning. I can't get out of bed. My back went out. Uh, I was so stressed, worrying about him being happy, uh, that it was like, what the f- 
fuck am I going to do? If, what if this guy's not happy? And that's, you know, that's the thing about when you want everybody yeah. to be happy and you're in a situation like that. Yeah. Well, you know There's something? There's a lot of everybody. Fuck it. Everybody's not going to be happy all the time. Mm, yeah. Eddie shows up. Uh, Chelsea, my ex, went out, found a, an acupuncturist to come. Got me. Mas- I was getting massage and acupuncture. It was my neck and my back. I could hardly move. And Eddie shows up to do the rehearsal. And I'm like, oh, I can, I can, what am I going to do? I mean, I'm like, I'm ready to get a sub. I was really in a lot of pain. We go in. I, had, I remember I had this real weird acupuncture thing where they were putting cups on me, bleeding me, putting acupuncture things in me. But this woman came with this other thing where she would be tapping it, tat, 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 and lift it off. And it would just look like, it looked like someone had used a meat tenderizer on my back. Yeah. And it was bleeding. And she'd think, so then. That's terrible. I go in. <laughs> And Eddie has this song. If we, you know, you could see it on 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 on, on YouTube. Uh, YouTube, yeah. And uh, it sounds like, how, was it Hots for Teacher? That was, yeah. As fast as I could play, he said, "Oh, it's got to be two bass drums." I said, "I'll have two pedals. I'll just use double pedal, which I never used. It'll be fine. It'll be fine." I think it was like a shuffle. It was really yeah, fast. Yeah, yeah, real fast shuffle. And I go. Yeah, yeah, well, we'll get it, we'll get it, we'll get it. Get it. No, he, but the two bass drums, he's one guy. Yeah. I said, I'm going to do I'm gonna do my setup, just show up and see how it is. So it's like to the last minute, we don't know. And I'm thinking, I got all these guys to deal with. I got Carly to deal with, who's always really cooperative when it comes to me. She's always just yeah. really been good, there for me, you know, because I've known her since I was, tw- I met her when I was 21. Right, you guys go way back. Way Decades, back. yeah. Yeah. Right. So um, he shows up, we go through it. He's like a pig in shit. Uh, <laughs> he tried to tell him. So happy. Yeah. Man, this sounds great. Loved Tony. Yeah, Levin. sure. You know, because he and Tony. Loves Tony well, Levin. you know, and Tony's a big performer on yeah, stage. Yeah. And Tony and I go way back. He was, you know, he and I were on the road together with Herbie Mann in like 1972. Wow. So I've known him for one of my favorite Tony stories is I was with him. <clears throat> he and I are both are on a plane, just the two of us. We're flying to Macon, Georgia, we're going to do an album down in Macon. And we're going to do James's brother Livingston Taylor's album in Macon, Georgia. He wanted to do it there. I think Peebo Bryson was there playing. And also Chuck Lovell from The Stones was playing piano. Mm-hmm. And they lived down there. So, so he said, let's go, and we'll go down there. L- lived it. And I remember on the plane flying down, Tony looked just like I do right now, <laughs> except uh-huh. his hair might have been a little longer. Yeah. And for the, for anybody who's not watching this, who does can't see us right now, my hair is back in a bun. You know, it's long, and I have a really long beard. Tony looked just like this, only we were twenty, yeah, three years old or something. And uh, he said, "I think I'm going to shave everything off." Uh-huh. And I go, "Yeah, right." So we're flying, we fly down. I go, "Yeah, well, okay, good. That I'm really interested to see what that looks like." And I remember going to the hotel, and I remember going to bed that night, waking up the next morning, and it's a beautiful hot day in Macon, Georgia. And below, I'm in my hotel room on maybe the eighth floor or something, and right above the pool, and there was like a astroturf and pool. And I look out, and there's a woman sitting in a chair. It's early in the morning, sunning herself in the chair by the pool. And I see a guy doing Tai Chi <laughs> by himself over on the side. I hope it's David Cassidy. And he's completely bald. Oh, no. And I'm looking, and I go, I wonder. Holy shit. <laughs> and at, back then, I had really good eyesight. I went, Tony? <laughs> I'm looking, and he goes, yeah, I told you I was going to shave everything off. He was doing his whole Tai Chi routine. Wow. So I was there the And day. so it started then. Yeah, right there. That's, wow. Yeah, that's I remember that. <laughs> back when he had hair to tie I'm, back. I, I don't even know what he was thinking. I'm just going to... I'm, I'm going to try it out. This, yeah. And he's been that way ever since. When you are a music director, do you have to put a little bit of that level of, of care and angst into it before you can go, it's going to be fine? I mean, you have to learn the lesson with Eddie to go, he's going to be fine. We have good guys. But is that part of how you do things? It, it was. Now I take it. I take my work very seriously, but I let's say I'm going to go into a room and I've got Dave Spinoza. Hugh McCrack is no longer with us. He passed mm-hmm. away. He, one of my best friends, probably. You go in a room with those guys, Tony Levin, Kenny Asher, 
Pendarvis, the guys that I work with all the time. Yeah. No, nothing bad's coming out of that room. There's nothing. Yeah. The only thing that would ever happen is if we all walked out. If we all just said fuck. <laughs> right. Because you you don't get better right guys than that in a, especially in a creative ensemble which it really was. Everybody came in with their material. Eddie wrote that piece for that show. Everyone else whatever they brought in they might have brought like I don't remember what Gilmore did but it was great and he was great. You know everybody walks in with a little bit of an attitude because they're the diva. Yeah. When you do a show like that, the biggest thing you have to deal with is that everyone is a diva. Sure. Everybody's the fucking star. You know, and, and you just have to go in there. And, and when I go into a place like that, and then there's five of us and one of them, we're the star. I've always had that attitude. We're going to make you sound really good. Yeah. So just relax. Relax. That's the way I always felt. Yeah. And I don't think I've been wrong a whole lot. There no, you're been... putting them in good hands. Yeah, I mean, if you're going in with a band like that, you're going to feel really good. Right. Yeah. Take it easy. But boy, I'll tell you, the amount of insecurity that you have to deal with sometimes is just, it's unbelievable. But I, B.B. King, for example, could not have been a better guy to work with. That guy's got so many miles behind him. He came point, in I mean, and the, he just, the whole thing you're talking about. By now in your career, what is it you have to fear? <laughs> well, and then you know, B. B. King, the, I'm sure. At same time, yeah. he at that point he's probably in his seventies. Yeah. What what's he got to fear? He sat down, sat in the room, uh-huh. and he goes, uh-huh. first of all, we couldn't do enough of his songs. Mm. Second of all, Hugh McCracken. We did The Thrill Is Gone, and we did something else. Uh, I can't remember what we did, but I know we played The Thrill Is Gone, okay. whether it was on the video or not. We did that in rehearsal, and we did another one of his fa- famous songs that he did. And Hugh McCracken played guitar on The Thrill Is Gone for B.B. Uh-huh. and arranged <laughs> yeah, it. Okay. He did the arrangement. So so B.B. was just, I swear, yeah. I can still remember him. He, this is the most... The most tense I saw B.B. King the whole time we were doing this was this. <laughs> That's not very tense. No. <laughs> no. Hey, how y'all doing? Hey, how you doing? Everything good? There's some food around here. You know, he was just chill. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Dave Gilmore was pretty great. You know, there and there, there's a bunch of divas there. But he not only was he great doing that. We he came and. St- he came and hung out with the band somewhere else and brought a couple of guys from his band to hang out with us someplace else, some other gig we were doing or something. He was a good he was a good guy. They were all really great. But um, doing that kind of a gig, the toughest part generally is knowing when you're in one of those th- situations is you just got to make sure that everybody, everybody's relaxed and everybody's relaxed and just... Loose. Take care of them. Yeah. You know, you just got to do, do... When I say take care of them, I'm not going to hold your hand. Right. No, you're just going to provide them space to do his thing. You just do your job. Mm-hmm. If you do your job, they're in great hands. It's just like you guys, when you talk about the military, everybody does their job. Yeah. Something could go wrong. There's always a chance something, goes something wrong. could go wrong. Every time, yeah. Yeah, but you do your job, there's nothing more anybody can ask you to do the same with music it's the same with acting you know i spend a lot of time with actors and producers because i do a lot of stuff you know i've been around that business a long time the you know I the walls gonna say because i like hot chicks and that's where the hot chicks are yeah <laughs> you know what i'm kind of past the whole walking into the room and being that guy you said i was whenever you said you saw me because i wish he was here now <laughs> uh, but uh, oh. sure, I like being around hot chicks, but they, you know, I, I, they think I'm an Uber driver. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell you, there's this friend of mine. She's she's a friend of mine who's in town, and we've done some work. This she's uh, from Korea, and she's very young. And I'm doing a lot of work with this guy Tom Cultibiano right now, who's one of the writers on Everybody Loves Raymond. We're very very close friends, and I don't know if I told you last time I saw you when you were here, I had been working on this children's stuff, like this videos, 
these he has a clown he's a puppeteer he has a puppet a clown puppet named mr clown and uh, it's been on and on and on for years and 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 he works a lot with ray romano they're very close and when ray does stand up and stuff like that tom goes with him and they when ray does a movie a lot of times tom is on the set and they they collaborate writing they've they were wrote together for everybody loves raymond and ray brought him in for that and so I was doing, I'm doing a lot of writing now of children's music. Huh. Hmm. But we were having a tough time because it's hard because, for example, right now we're supposed to be working this week. That's what I'm working on here. I'm doing these charts now for these tunes that I, we're supposed to be writing. He came to me a while ago, and we had been talking about this. I always, I've been writing a lot of music for his um it's all on YouTube and stuff like that. A lot actually of writing. You're actually writing. Writing the music. Well, just yeah. playing. The, you know, I'm okay. playing it into the computer and doing it all myself. Yeah, but you got staff paper out and you showed me those chord charts and stuff. You... Yeah, I'm writing this stuff because, <clears throat> well, I'll explain this in a second. That's what I'm doing most of the time right now is I'm writing these, um, I'm writing mostly kids stuff. But I said, he goes, we got we to gotta work some more music because I've been scoring mostly hmm. this stuff. But the the point of the story was this Korean. He's been dealing with this other very. Well, it's just for toddlers. This stuff from his is educational for kids, and the 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 Korean stuff is this 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 company called Smart Study, and they have um, a, a character named Pink Fong, and they also have this thing called Baby Shark, which is two billion or three billion hits on youtube Jesus. it's a worldwide phenomenon and uh the the woman who's billion the yeah. woman who's the 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 woman who's in charge in the united states uh, is a friend of ours and um she's she's young as i said and i met her through tom and her name is bin and and um she doesn't have any idea what i do so tom tom was telling me the other day they were out they were out to dinner in Vegas. It was a convention last week. The, the head of children's YouTube uh -huh. uh, content uh, worldwide, who lives in Singapore, was there for the convention. Uh -huh. And they met because Bin's company is huge in this. <laughs> Absolutely. Huge. Yeah. So they, he they're having a dinner, dinner. meeting. Yeah. <laughs> and Tom also, because his, his is up, up and coming, and Mr. Clown and Pink Fong are doing a lot of stuff together. And they said, somehow, my name came up. But I'm not blowing my own horn or anything. I'm just telling you what the difference in people and what they... I know this, this woman very well. She was staying at my house. She's, you know, when I was gone out of town, she stays here. Because when she would come in from Korea rather than stay at a hotel, I just said stay at the house. Months. Yeah. And we've been to dinner together and spent a lot of time together and are, are good friends. The guy and my friend Thomas talk, talking and talking and oh yeah who oh yeah and so I'm we're doing this stuff and this guy Rick Marotta is writing the music for, for my stuff and he goes wait Rick Marotta the drummer Rick Marotta yeah why you know who you know you know him no well I know who he is and then he runs the laundry list of he goes down a list of Lawrence oh, Evon James yeah. Taylor uh, Steely Dan Steve Carly Dan, Dan, Dan yeah. Bing Bing but, like, he really knew a lot of stuff. Uh -huh. Can I meet him? And Ben says, meet Rick? Why would you want to meet him? <laughs> meet Rick? Only the because guy says, I stay at his home. Do I know he's not homeless? <laughs> guy, guy turns, they turn to her and they go, he's Rick Marotti. He's, he's, really, he's really good. He's a, he's, you know, he's a well-known musician, drummer. He is? <laughs> he drove me really? here in his Camry. <laughs> like, seriously, seriously I, when I say I'm an Uber driver. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jeez. Well, you know, uh, such is your lot in life. But there are some of us you don't have fooled, and so I'm glad he was one of them. I'll tell uh, you, though. Did, you ask, did, he, did he come by? Did you meet him? Yeah, well, they had a dinner, and they asked me to go by, and I did meet oh, him. Okay. And I have to tell you something. Sometimes that can be as big a nightmare as... Doing working with divas, you know, because yeah. it's all the same question. Yeah, it was really not. It was one of those times where you meet with somebody that's kind of a fan, 
that is just a really good person and knows how to have a conversation. Uh-huh. You know, it's like he knew stuff that made me very interested. You guys know from being around me, you'll know that if you ask me a question, we talk. Sometimes it's interesting. Sometimes it's boring, you yeah. know. But he uh, he knew stuff that was interesting, and he asked me stuff that was an int- I had interesting answers. Wasn't the for same him. thing that you've been asked a million times. No, but you know, I was getting into no, I was getting into like he knew. I would mention something, and he would mention the song title, or I would mention a song title, and he would mention he would know guys that played on it, yeah, or something like that, and then. One of his favorites, I think, he knew a lot about Warren Zevon, and it was, it's always, whenever I could talk about Warren, I always feel good, hmm. because um, there's just a lot of history with, with Warren Zevon and me, yeah. and Waddy, and, uh, and we're talking about Waddy and Warren and Jackson. Oh, his favorite, one of his favorite artists ever was Jackson, and I got to tell him a couple of Jackson stories hmm. that were interesting, and it was just really nice, but sometimes it can be like the same same thing over and over. It's like you're in an interview, yeah. um, and you're really just at a dinner party, Yep. and uh, the one thing that I got to tell you that everybody asks all the time, what is it like working with Steely Dan? That's the one you get all the time. Sure. So <clears throat> one time, I don't know, about 10 years ago. When, when when Walter was still alive, which I still can't, having a hard time processing the fact that he's gone. Um, they did, ASCAP did a night, a tribute to Steely Dan night. You know, they do that. I was there for the tribute to Carly. Actually, Carly came to town, and she asked me to go with her to the tribute for her. And uh, I went, and when, when Donald and Walter were coming to do the tribute for Steely Dan, they said, oh, well, you, they wanted them to play. And so he said, well, why don't you get the guys that we work with? So why don't you get, like, Murata's there, um, and uh, Mike McDonald is is there, and I guess John Beasley, Neil Steubenhaus. So anyway, they just said, so Mike McDonald played, sang, and we did three or four Steely Dan songs. Yeah. And, and Michael sang the songs. And then they asked, this is a big thing. This is a big ASCAP thing at the Beverly Hilton Hotel. It's where they have the Oscars or the Golden Globes and yeah. stuff like that. Uh, where they've had the Golden Globes and a bunch of stuff. So they said, we'd like you to speak. And Donald and Walter said, no, we don't want to speak. But you know what? <laughs> we'd like Rick Murata to speak for us. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> so my bit that I did, I, I said about... They called me from the, uh, the, the people that were organizing the whole event. There's like 800 people there, I think. All industry, big, you know, big record industry. Mm-hmm. They called, they were like, it was incredulous to them. They were like, what, Rick? Well, I have a strange request. So we spoke to the guys at Steely Dan. We spoke to Donald and Walter, and they said that they'd rather you speak for them. I understand. I said, I know exactly why they said it. <laughs> so I, uh, we went and we rehearsed the place, and I said, just give me a room. <clears throat> so they gave me a hotel room. You know, I had a hotel room there for Anyway, so they said, just give me a room to go write. And I went up and I just scratched out a couple of bullet points. And I went downstairs. And basically what it was was I walked downstairs. And I, when, I went, when, when we did the show and came that part, um, you know, uh, Marilyn uh, Bergman came out and said, uh, we, we, have a, we have a strange request. People wanted, uh, Steely Dan asked for, the guys, uh, Donald and Walter asked for Rick Murata to speak. And she was, not, when she's announcing me, she was like, we don't really understand why. <laughs> <laughs> so I walk out <laughs> stage and I start the whole thing. I remember. Good evening, thank you, Marilyn. I remember uh, uh, I had just just two weeks earlier I had been there for another for ASCAP awards dinner, for where I got an award for one of those awards for Everybody Loves Raymond. <clears throat> there is a row of ASCAP music awards on uh, on the shelf. I got so I was getting one of those. And it was the first one I ever got. And when I walked up, I was really nervous. Marilyn Bergman came out. and the first, I was really nervous because I had to stand up in front of a bunch of composers that were really good and a bunch of industry people that were really powerful to accept an award for just being sort of an idiot composer, for having a really, <laughs> yeah. for having a huge number one show on the air. You know, that wasn't because of my great music, right. which I thought the music was great for that. It was because the show was the number one show. So I was really nervous about that, and I, 
And I remember she put me right at ease because she walked out and she said, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Ass Crap Awards. (laughs) And I just (laughs) cracked up. She had misspoken. Yeah. And she caught herself. The whole place went nuts. Yeah. So when I walked out, I said, you know, I was really nervous to come out here and speak. But I have to tell you, a couple of weeks ago, I was really nervous because I was coming out to to accept an, uh, an award. And... And Marilyn came out and introduced herself for the beginning of the night. Welcome to the uh, certain whatever annual ASCRAP Awards. And that was it. The people in the audience went crazy. I see Marilyn Bergman grabbing the top of her head like, <laughs> what have we gotten She's ourselves reliving into? Her moment. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, you know, <clears throat> I'm really glad that Donald and Walter had asked me to speak because I'd like to get something off my chest. Everywhere I go, the first question that anybody asks me, and I've worked with a lot of people, John Lennon, uh, Carly Simon, James Taylor, Jackson Brown, uh, Aretha Franklin, Roberta Flack, just on, I said, I just threw out a bunch of names. I said, but everywhere I go, the first question anybody asks me is, what's it like to work with Steely Dan? And I said, so what I'd like to do is tell you all that I have here in the room right now, and when you leave, you can tell everybody else <laughs> what it is that I'm telling you. And, and then I told them a story. And it was, I just told them a story, a, a real story about doing a, a, a session for Steely Dan. And I did, you know, I put a couple of, I, I sort of uh, amalgamized it. I put a bunch of, a few different stories together. They're to all wrapped it, into one. From one story, from, it's like from five sessions. It was the greatest sessions. hits story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then I made it all come to, to one. And it was, it was really funny. I like that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's on YouTube, everybody. You can go search it out. That, Is it? Yeah. Yeah. I saw that on YouTube. I, I don't remember exactly what the story was, but as you're saying it, I can go, yeah, I remember I didn't, that. You know, I didn't know it was on YouTube. Yeah. And we know you're a totally busy, man, and I really appreciate you taking uh, some time with us, but we're going to get out of your way so you can get back to work. Great. But we wanted to just say uh, thank you for having us. I didn't say anything us. interesting today. I had, no, I've, I've, yeah, I haven't I even had a chance. We were waiting for yeah. you to get started. <laughs> the, uh, Let me press record. <laughs> last time we saw you was at the uh, Roland Totally Drums event Yeah, a couple weeks ago. And he, here's the interesting thing that happened. Uh, we had a great time at that thing, met a lot of people. It was a lot of fun. One of the people we met outside was Greg Bissonette. And, you know, I had met him at a NAMM show years ago as well. So I talked to him for a minute. And then, of course, I had to pitch him. I gave him a business card. And I said, hey, we'd love to have you on the Break It Down show. You know, we have mutual friends and uh, and all that. And he gave me exactly what is the best you could expect, which was a, yeah, sure, I'll do it one of these days. You know, nudge of the elbow. And I was like, okay, he'll... You know, we'll have to run into him again. Why would he not do uh, it? He, it? Well, he would. He just, you know, he was, he's yeah, off the road. It wasn't so even that like a, it wasn't even that much of a yes no. It was. He said, "Oh yeah, that sounds great." Yeah, you it know, wasn't. Like, he wasn't sure, standoffish or anything. Yeah. God, no, he's, he's the a, complete opposite. Everybody, of that. Yeah. everybody always says nice things about Greg Bissonnet. and I knew Greg's dad. We all knew Greg's dad. When we yes, Greg's dad's. Let's face it, more famous than Greg or Matt. Anyway, you know, he gave me the yes, I'll I'll, I'll do your show, but it was one of those yeah someday. So then we were upstairs and we're walking down the hallway and we had to kind of nudge out of the hallway to get out of the way of somebody who was walking down the hallway who we later found out was Jimmy Jam. (laughs) And uh, he was really nice too. But then I ran into Greg and you at the same time. And when he saw that we knew each other, it seemed like he got a whole lot more serious about, yeah, I'll do that show some one of these days we really will. So... What I want to say is we appreciate uh, all the great stories that you tell us when you come on the show, and we appreciate that uh, all I got to do is throw around the name Rick Murata, and I get into places. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> you guys are bullshitting. But I, I, no, I'm, 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 I'm happy to hear that, and I, I'm also happy to hear that, that uh, I hope that Greg does it because he's, he's also loaded with stories. He's a great guy to talk to and he's a very very humble very modest guy yeah very talented guy and he has <clears throat> he'll be more 
very talented. He'll, guy. He's more focused than I am. He'll he talk is to you. all about that work, man. <clears throat> you know, we talk about playing through the fly shit, and he's got a sharpie, and he's writing on his snare drum head to make sure that he doesn't miss the change. Yeah, that guy is disciplined. <clears throat> yeah, so. there's a lot of guys that are like that. That, I, I mean, I, I have to be honest with you. If I'm in a work situation in, in that environment, I try to be as I try to be a little different than. I, this is how I act, but when it comes to work, yeah, I try to be really professional. You're so all business. Yeah, it's 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 um, you know, as long well, as that's why you've people, invo- enjoyed a 50, 60, 50 something year career. Well, it's people got to if as long as people treat you with respect, you treat them with respect back, and people are going to respect you enough to to trust you. You got to respect them enough to right. To be worthy of the trust. Be worthy of the trust. Exactly. Yeah. I feel that way. If yeah. people are going to take advantage of you, you can just go home. Yeah. But if you're just going to go out, if you're going to go out there and people are going to trust you, do the job. Okay. So Greg, come do the show. Uh, we're going to talk about some things that I think you'll find interesting. Yeah. I'm going to ask him about South 21st Shuffle, which probably he hasn't talked about in a long time. I'll I'll, um, I'll be happy to listen to an interview with Greg. All right. There you go. No we didn't kidding. talk about the work this summer. We I should have talked to you about it. We're going to be playing. We're playing all summer. This uh, we're doing this Dealey Dan tribute thing that my brother has going with two drummers. We're doing a casino in Schenectady. Okay. In July, I do a soft shoe up there. It's really <laughs> nice. <laughs> and we're doing we're doing Daryl's place in July. All right. With that band and the Murata Brothers band is working all summer at uh, Lola's on Martha's Vineyard. If anybody's on Martha's Vineyard, Wednesday for the summer, nights. Wednesday nights. It's 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 popping. It's wow. really good. The um, Joanne Cassidy, the singer who actually was produced, her first album was produced. Livingston Taylor is a phenomenon. She is unbelievable. My jaw dropped when I didn't have anything to do with putting this band together. Jerry did it, and uh, John Zeman and Zoe Zeman, they're so good. And we, Wes Naj, great keyboard player. We we just have a great time, and it's really good. And this whole summer, I'm going to be working. I'm supposed to be on vacation. <laughs> so we're yeah. going to be on Martha's Vineyard in New York. You know, okay. doing gigs. We're talking about doing, Jerry was talking about doing the cutting room in, or, 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 or Iridium in New York City. So I hope we do get He's to He's really it. putting you to work all summer. Oh, man, it's unbelievable. Daryl's drummer is Brian Dunn. He's a good friend of ours. And uh, you're going to love him. He's a great guy. No, Great guy. Plays where, traditional. Where was... Wears a hat backwards. Who was... But I was... On the road with Daryl and John, and uh-huh. that, but I was only for a, a one tour because we were doing Carly Simon and Hall and Oates same night, and I was working with Carly, and they were all in the same management. It was all um, uh, Tommy and Matola and Brian Doyle were managing uh-huh. them, and so you were pulling double duty. Yeah, uh. me and T Bone. Okay, wow. The only ones were me and T Bone, and we're, every night we're just like trash. Yeah, because yeah. we'd go do Daryl and John first, and then Carly would close the show. But um, I can't remember the drum. Who was her? Wasn't it was someone else playing drums at that well, time? Well, Brian started after T Bone passed, so it's yeah it's later. Actually, got that gig. Who was yeah. the other guy that had it before him? I, oh. I can't remember right off the top of my head. Yeah, but you know, it was one of those things. Uh, Brian was playing with Chuck Loeb, and uh, I think when the gig came up, somebody happened to mention to Chuck, and Chuck said, "You know, you should." take a look at, at my drummer's name is Brian and I'll send him down and you know it was one of those situations where uh he just stumbled in at the right time or no he was playing with Chuck Loeb and Chuck Loeb has had always been a kind of a mentor to him and he was playing with the average white band yeah and the percussionist who's in in uh, Daryl's band now also came from the average white band or the bass player you're talking about Daryl and John's band right Hold yes on. yeah I want to now, see. I'm just hoping they're not the on the road. I want to see Daryl because I haven't seen him in a while, but I want to see him and talk to him because I need to pick his brain about Lyme disease. Ah, because I have the same thing. I have this. My this is the second time I've gotten Lyme disease, and this is one is the residual. Yeah. This is the one where they got rid of it, but it's it sort of gets in. It's I've just had to have stays this stays in there. Yeah, uh-huh. I had to have this procedure done on my spine where I had to have these injections. The PRP, you know, the uh, 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 where to take your blood, your platelets, and they inject them into your yeah to heal yeah because I'm, Wait, I wasn't able plasma. to plasma yes yeah. and Daryl had it too. Daryl didn't have Regenex, but he has 
he had Lyme disease to where it was so debilitating. He thought he thought he was going to die. Wow. And I saw him being interviewed. In my, and Jerry, uh, Jerry uh, worked with Daryl for years, Daryl and John for years as well. And he was telling me about Daryl. And, and um, I wanted to talk to him because I'm going to, nobody on the West Coast knows anything about Lyme disease. That's true. Me. Nobody. My doctors here, when I talk about it, they go, yeah, we don't know anything about that, but they'll talk about something else. So that's why I'm, when I'm going back east, I'm leaving next week to get back home. And, and We can't make bagels worth a shit out here either. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, they're on tour. They're on tour with Train right now. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. All Seriously? Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. You know, Ray Romano from Everybody Loves Raymond, and Ray and I play golf. Mm. And I played with Ray this week. And I think I'm going to go with him to New York next week. And Ray said, when we're in New York, do you want to play Liberty National with the lead singer from Train? Mm -hmm. Oh, Pat, yeah. Because he's a golfer. That guy's a spectacular performer, too. Really, he's, he's supposed got the to be crowd really good, yeah. just eaten out of his hand. I didn't all know long. that they were out with Daryl. I yeah. got to get now. I got to get Ray to find this guy to find out how I can get a hold of uh, Daryl. I could Here's Brian. something that I get, I'm going to get a real kick out of saying. We'll put you in touch with Daryl. <laughs> 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 I talk to Brian all the time. We'll, t- we'll put you in touch with Daryl. Yeah, um, by the way, and speaking of Lyme, uh, my girlfriend's son got it in Scotland. And so in Orange County, there's a guy that's like a specialist in Lyme. Really? Yeah. And so I'll... I'll Do you have that it. info? I will get it for you today or tomorrow, but depending Great. on when, when I, if I Great. forget and everything else. But I I'm going to see... I have two doctor's appointments in Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's this is Lyme c- Central. There. Right. But... Um, uh, I, yeah, that's a pain in the... It's a pain in... Literally a pain in the in neck. In the neck, yeah. Right. Well, let's button this thing up. Yeah. Rick Morata, thank you so much, man. We love my you. Pleasure. We love every time you're uh, on my the pleasure, show. My pleasure. I hope this was recorded well. It did. I don't it know if I great. said anything good. We're just, no, you were awesome. You we're kidding just me? having like a, we may as well be having drinks or something, you know? That's, that's kind of the point. Exactly it. Yeah. That's when we know we've got you. Rick Morata, everybody.